We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we've got a question from one of our long-term fans and Patreon patrons, Roger Malosh of Roger Dodger Games. Roger writes, Hey, Mo and Sean. Hearing or watching your show has become part of my weekly routine, and I look forward to it every week. Well, thanks for that, Roger. You recently acquired a game called Shamans, or Shamans. It's a kind of, sort of, semi-cooperative game with trick-taking, deduction, and hidden roles. Oh, it's based in the world of ancient shamans. It seemed to be way outside the box, so I had to have it because I'm attracted to very unique games. I love games with unique mechanics and gameplays like Seven, Quad Heroes, Pit, and First Contact. I also like a really unique theme, like in the game Processing, where you're voting to send humans or cows to the alien food processors, <laughs> or Euphoria, where you're controlling your own dystopia. Art and all that fluff doesn't usually matter much to me, but I did buy one game based mostly on its looks. The artwork in the game Imaginarium looks like Escher and Marguerite had a baby <laughs> in steampunk land. I instantly added this game to my collection. Now, what games would you consider really outside the box? Do you know of any that have gone too far and are too weird to be fun? Well, thanks for the detailed question there, Roger. And of course, for being one of our patrons and for being a fan of the show for as long as we've been on the air, almost 200 episodes worth. Now for this list, what I decided to do is stick to games that I've actually played, most of which I still own and still enjoy. Though I did some research and added a couple of others that we may not have actually played. Fair enough. So the first game that popped into my head when thinking about this was actually further down the list. But the second game that came into my head was Zolkin. Because of one aspect of the game that is so difficult to quantify because there's nothing that's in the rulebook. And that is that your own patience is a resource in that game. In that game, you are putting pieces out on a gear and that gear is going to turn. And your guy's going to move along on the gear. And eventually you're going to take it off and get what spot it's on. And the whole game's about either putting new people out or taking them off in order to go up tracks and get points. And it's a point salad at that point. But it's the fact that the longer you can leave your people out, the better thing you tend to get. And it really does get tempting to pull your pieces off to feel like you're doing something. And I don't know how to quantify that because, like I said, it's not in the rule book. It's not like part of the game. It's not a mechanic. But the fact that your own patience can get the better of you when playing Zolkin, to me, makes it really stand out. Absolutely. Uh, so the next one was one I found, uh, which is a really interesting concept, and that is Shadows in the Forest. Now, this is an intriguing game where you are playing with uh, one verse many in a forest. Uh, the forest is made out of wooden, uh, you know, pieces of wood, you know, pieces of wood in the shape of the trees and mm -hmm. that are standing up. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, just doing the interlocked. And uh, one player is a light. Uh, in the original versions, it was a candle. Yeah. Uh, in the new versions, it's an LED lantern. Uh, and whereas the other players are trying to hide from the light and are frozen when in the light. Uh, but able to move around. And once all the players are able to hide from the source of light in the shadows, they win. Otherwise, the light wins. Yeah, I think this one's a fascinating one. I think I played it a long time ago. This one's been around for a number of years. This oh, is yeah. not a new game. No, no, not at all. But there are so few games out there that use actual light. Mm -hmm. Like I personally have played one, and it was part of an escape room game. Now, I do have to say... I don't like the new version as much as a lighting yeah. guy. The new version with the lantern has a really diffused light. Yeah. So the shadows aren't crisp when you've got the candle in there, which I fully admit is a dangerous and not recommended practice. <laughs> you get the sharp edges of shadows yeah. where it meets the trees. And unfortunately the, the light from the new led is just really diffused and doesn't give you the same effect. You just need a brighter LED somehow. I'm sure there are people out there who have DIY <laughs> shadow in the forest to make it better. I think there's some themed versions of this as well. So I think I remember one with little raccoons trying to hide. Okay. All right. The actual first game I thought of when I read Roger's question was Go Cuckoo, which maybe I should have grouped with some other ones. But this one is just everything about this is unique. 
starting from the fact that someone at Haba said, let's put out a board game for Easter and we're going to make an Easter themed games for people. And we're going to make it a limited release at the time. So that like you had to get it in time for Easter. Then you take the fact that it's a dexterity game where you're basically playing reverse pickup sticks. You have a bunch of wooden sticks in a can and you're pulling them out and building a bird's nest. And then there's something that we mentioned last week, or was it two weeks ago? I don't even remember now. When we were talking about end game triggers, where not only do you have to place all your eggs to actually win the game, you have to put this big chunky cuckoo meeple on top of everything without it all falling apart. And like that just adds so many different unique elements. And honestly, except for the slight resemblance to pickup sticks, there really isn't anything else in common with any other games out there. No, absolutely. Go Cuckoo uh, stands on its own. Uh, next up, I found another one called Cur uh, Pyramid of the Penguin. That's Penguin Queen, essentially, uh, mashed together. It's also known as Curse of the Mummy. Now, we've talked in the past about uh, the mysterious, uh, sorry, what's the name of the... Um, Magical Labyrinth? Magical Labyrinth. This is similar, except it's actually played on a vertical board where you have a one versus many again, a mummy or, a you know, the penguin queen on one side and a bunch of other travelers, adventurers on the other side. Now, the interesting thing here is the, the reason for this vertical board is it's using magnets. Now, the mummy or penguin actually can't see the adventurers, whereas mm -hmm. the adventurers can see the mummy or penguin. Oh, interesting. So the mummy is moving around and they know where it is, but they have limited movement due to dice rolling and such like that. So the, the mummy has to move around and try and take out the adventurers while the adventurers know where they are, but can't always necessarily get away. Interesting. So it's a, it's an interesting twist on hidden movement and, uh, and, and using the magnets in that, in that manner. Yeah, there are some really neat magnet games out there. And that may remember there's another one that didn't make my list because I never played it. But you each build two sides of a map and you can't see the other side and it's get through the maze with a marble and it's mm -hmm. face up that also kind of like that. But nothing with the the one versus many. I got to say that's one versus many done right without any silly tracking things on <laughs> paper or deck of cards to show where you've been. Yep. Sounds great. My next one is Niagara. Um, it's not unusual nowadays to find games that use the box as part of the game. Um, I could have put Cleopatra Society of Architects on this list, for example, or uh, more recently, um, the mon uh, Mountains on a Molehills also use the box. But this one uses the box in a really unique way in that the box, all it does is holds up the board. And then you put this two layer board over both box tops and have it fall off the edge. And you literally have like the waterfall of Niagara falling off the edge. But then there's a track on these boards. that's like a... Um, a ravine i'm thinking i'm i'm totally grabbing the wrong word here but there's there's like inset area and you put these plastic discs on them and then you have little canoes and you put them out on the discs and you have you're going to grab meeple you're going to grab um rubies and gems from various different spots along it but the whole thing is at the end of every turn you slide a blank disc on the end and all of the canoes slide down the niagara river and the neat part here too is that there's a br a fort and in general most of the time, because of the odds and physics, it's going to split. It's going to go left, then it's going to go right. It's going to go left, it's going to go right. It's going to go left, and it's going to go right. And you can kind of plan ahead. But every now and then, it doesn't quite behave the way you expect. And I got to say, there's pretty much nothing more satisfying than playing properly and pushing one of your opponent's canoes over the edge of the falls. <laughs> so, like, a bunch of neat, unique things going on in that game, and really solid game. It's one of those games where everyone gets the same hand of cards at the beginning to take their moves. And once they're out, you get all your hand back. So you can kind of predict what other people are going to do. And did he use his nine yet? Really neat game. Interesting. And that was Niagara. And next up, uh, we have Hamster Roll, which is very unique. And with that, we're sort of rolling in a lot of other dexterity types games. Because in many ways, almost every dexterity game is in its own way a unique yeah. Uh, sort of concept. So games like Pitch Car, Ice Cool, Flick 'em Up, Tick Tock oh. Woodsman, um, the Fleet Flick Fleet, uh, and all these other Dex games all have something unique about them. Generally, uh, unless you're looking, you know, Pitch Car or the and and the six hundred other parts of Pitch Car. Yeah, but uh, but yeah. So uh, but Hamster Roll especially is one of those really unique ones because of the way not only how it stands out. But the fact that they 
uh, stand by the fact that every one is handmade. Mm-hmm. It's not perfectly stamped out in 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 uh, so that they're all the same. Every box you get, it is a handmade, unique game every time you buy it. Yeah, that's my favorite part. I think that's why Hamster Roll belongs on this list a little more than the others is the fact that like everyone's wheel is going to roll differently and all the slats might be at slightly different angles and it, everyone's wheel's unique. And I love that. But there are so many unique deck schemes. Like you got games where you're trying to stack things on pandas and you got games where you're trying to not have a Yeti fall into your bowl of spaghetti. And like, like we can make an entire list of unique dexterity games and it'd be like every one, like yeah. you got ice cool where you're flicking penguins around that you can make jump over walls just like like just dexterity games of their own could be this whole list. Yep. Next up, I have Ghost Blitz and uh, Toyetic. Very cool looking game where you have it. Th- I might get that it's been a long time since I played this one because it's a, it's very much a kid's game. But it's one I kind of wish I owned because I think we'd play it out at certain nights like my birthday party on the weekend. It would have been a good one. I think it's five different objects that are in five different colors. And what happens is you shuffle a deck of cards and you flip it up. And you have to grab the unique item that doesn't match anything on the card. So it can't be the same color and it can't be the same object. And it'll be like a picture of a ghost holding a the 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 like wine bottle sitting in the chair and uh, the books on the floor. And you've got to figure out what's not showing. And you're like, oh, it's the mouse. There's no mouse in this picture. And yet first person to grab the mouse wins that card. And you play till you've grabbed enough cards. And it's just such like the unique, cool pieces. Um, I don't even know the publisher. I think it might be Zoc, but it's one of those German wooden wood toy companies that put out this board game. So you have these fantastic wood pieces that are designed for kids. So there's no like spiky bits or anything. And you're literally physically having to grab a piece. And I guess that part's kind of dexterity, but it's really about doing the deduction. And then every now and then there'll be the actual item that's on the table and it'll be perfect. And you're supposed to then grab the item. So you can't even just fall into the trick of always looking for the thing that's different. Sometimes like, oh, wait, it's the white ghost because the ghost's white and you have to grab that one. Surprisingly, there's a really good app version of this, which I've actually played more than the physical copy. And that's what my kids used to play at restaurants when I was trying to calm them down when they were younger. Is I, It was on Apple, at least. I don't know if it's on Android. And all that is the card comes up and you tap on the appropriate thing and you have a timer that counts down. Uh, there is also a Ghost Blitz 2, which mm-hmm, can be played new. on its own or used to expand the original. Uh, now, next up, I have Hanabi. This is one we've talked about a number of times, and I've played uh, oh, any number of times on uh, Board Game Arena. But this is one of the first uh, card games where cards are facing the other opponents. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not something like the headbands game where you've got one card in there. Yeah, yeah, that, but this, this, is, this the, is your, this your is... whole hand is facing the other players and not you. You have no idea what's in your hand, but you know what's in everybody else's mm-hmm. hands. Uh, and the communication, or lack thereof, uh, that comes from that, and the and the trying to, you know, hope everyone manages to get to play, and but knowing that, that someone's about to make a horrible mistake and not being able to say anything yes, about it. You're like, oh. Uh, the limited communication where, you know, say, giving giving some information to the players is, is really unique. Uh, and as far as we know, I think, uh, you know, Hanabi was the first to really, yeah, really do this one. As far as I know, I, I do own a couple games that went on since, but none of them were as good as Hanabi either. Like they did some neat things with backs of cards, but nothing quite. Yeah, like there's, there's 777 and, and a couple of other things like that, but they're, they aren't the same. There's uh resistor, which I have right here. This uses it. The opponent player, opponent player can see the other side of your cards and use them, tell you to flip them and stuff. But that's more of a memory game. So it's one of those once a card's out, it's like your action could be flip that one because you know what's on the other side. But it just none of them really took off like Hanabi. Yep. All right. Next, I have Town Center. Um, I don't even know how to describe this game. So you have a board and you have a bunch of cubes and the cubes represent different types of districts in a growing like metropolis, like your town center. And the game itself seems pretty easy where you're like, you, you pull cubes out of a bag and you're drafting. And you're like, I got a blue, I got a this. And the whole thing about this is that there's this entire system called organic growth. And I am not going to be able to repeat the rules here because this is actually a fairly heavy game that is very thinky. And what it is, it's like, if there are enough residential buildings, or sorry, if there are enough commercial buildings for people to work, the residential buildings near them will grow. 
and it's called organic growth because you have no control over it and you can't stop it. And some bad things can happen where if things can't grow up, they start sprawling out. And your town being sprawling is bad and negative points for everything on the outskirts. And this is a game that not only needs like grafting logic, um, strategy, but also spatial thinking. And that alone just blows people away. And this is a game I love and many other people I've taught it to absolutely hate and never want to play again. Because it just they didn't like the way it felt and the way it made them think. And they're like, that was not fun. That was like like work and trying to figure out a logic puzzle that you're stuck on with no hints. So to me, it's just that organic growth system combined with what looks like, you know, a dexterity game, really a stacking game. Yeah, it's it's almost um, uh, I want to say like uh, a tower game meets SimCity meets um, uh, Suburbia. It, you know, it's got, yeah. it's got that high level of complexity and, and, and things triggering off of other things, but it's also just little wooden cubes. Uh, yeah. it's a really, it's a really interesting one. It, it is. It's, it's very bizarre. And another one that, that didn't quite make our list, I guess, cause I don't see it here. Maybe we'll toss it in is, uh, the climbers. It reminds me a bit of the climbers, but like, it's not the climber yeah, cause it's, it's, you're spending, you're even getting money and you have to pay taxes and you have to buy these cubes and to place them costs money. And. The amount of connected commercial blocks that are close enough to a residential block is what pays you at the end of the turn. Like, this is not a light game, despite what it looks like. Well, next up, we have one we just reviewed recently, and that's Drop It. Mm -hmm. Connect four that isn't an already solved math problem. <laughs> it's, it's, it's similar to Connect four in some ways, whereas you're dropping things down. But unlike just trying to, a simple match, you're dealing with a lot of different interacting problems of colors and shapes that can't interact with mm -hmm. each other. Uh, and those negative interactions are really what makes the game on top of the quirky little physics problems of what shapes drop in what ways and land and bounce and, and whatnot. Uh, so that becomes, you know, drop it becomes what looks like a simple kids game until the first time you sit down and figure out how you're going to get that piece to where you want it to be. Yep. Now, what I also love about that one is the ability, once you know the game, to plan ahead and play cutthroat, where you can look at what your opponent has over there, and you're like, well, if I drop this here, I might not get anything, but there's no way they're getting anything either. And I think that's what really brings it to the next level. Next up, I think this, out of everything we mentioned so far, may top the list for weird, out-of-the-box, strange games. I go cuckoos up there too, but Ugtect, you are playing the, like the theme. You are playing cavemen architects, trying you're like the master architect, trying to convince other cavemen to build structures the way you want them built, and you have to do this through two different things. One is a language based on grunts, and the other is interpretive dance. So you like indicate the piece by whatever a gunga, and you indicate how they want to move it by like wiggling your hips. And then when they get it wrong, you have a foam, not foam, sorry, a blow up. Um, I, I forget what it says on it. You have a blow up club with a spike on it, which is also blow up that you hit them with to tell them they're getting it wrong. You cannot touch the pieces. You are trying to get the other people to do it. And no caveman poetry did not do the bop people with the thing when the wrong thing first. It comes from Ugte. Oh, there we go. This is one we should have played on my birthday. But I didn't think of. I think Tori would love Ugg Tech. Right. Well, next up, we've got one that I recently finally played for my first time, and that is Super Motherload. This is a game where you're playing uh, people on Mars trying to uh, explore and develop Mars for its resources. Uh, it's a deck builder, but it's got a really interesting descending game board mechanic where you're slowly working your way down deeper into the planet to gain those resources uh delving below and drilling down and using explosives to try and gain things which will get you more coin uh coins which will get you more cards which will get you more abilities uh yeah, and the, the vertical you know the vertical scroller concept uh in a in a board game is really mm -hmm. what this game does well yeah, people like to call it Dig Dug the board game, and for pretty good reason. There's no monsters to fight, but you definitely kind of get that digging feel. Uh, there's a few things in this that make it stick out, too. Like that whole system where you have to take the crystals you find to put onto your different crew types to train your crew. 
is actually really well done. Like that's one of the neatest get new cards in your deck mechanics I've ever seen. Next one for me, I don't actually have the original version, which I don't know if you can see it behind me, uh, but Survive Escape from Atlantis. I actually have the sci-fi version, which all it does is change one thing where some of the tiles have special abilities on the bottom. This is a game that destroys itself as you play it. You start the game with this giant island and all kinds of meeples all over it, representing the different players, and there's some lifeboats on the outside, and then all of a sudden a horrible catastrophe happens, and every turn you're going to be removing pieces from the island. The goal of the game is to get as many as your meeple to the outer islands to survive, but at the same time, when you're moving your pieces, you can also move the various sea monsters and sharks and other things, especially if you have the expansions, the ton of expansions for this game. And then there is a ton of take that where you can share boats or not share boats and capsize boats. And then there's even a neat mechanic where your meeples are worth different points. So you're like trying to save your three, but you're not as worried about your ones, but you don't want your opponents to know which one's your three. Because if you keep moving the one, they're going to be like, oh, that's his three. We got to go get that one. Just such a unique game that has been around since I think it's the 60s, maybe even be 50s. Still in production today. They just keep cutting out prettier, neater versions. Yeah, it actually started off as Escape from Atlantis and then became Survive Escape from Atlantis uh, a little later uh, when they, when they sort of upgraded it. Uh, and it's got some fantastic stuff. And again, so much content as well as the sci-fi version uh, yep. of it as well. Uh, so much going on there. Uh, next up, we've got one that we're going to be reviewing a little later tonight. And that is Once Upon a Line. Now, this game is a word find meets scratch lottery ticket campaign game. And if that interests you, maybe you should stick around for our review later and see what we thought about this strange game with a unique playing concept. Now, I will call it out just for those of you only watching this segment on YouTube so you're not listening to the full podcast. This is a very unique one that definitely is different from anything else I've ever played. You are trying to find words. Words have you look at cards. Cards have you give you more words to find and eventually get through a story. It's it's definitely it inspired this show tonight, to be honest. Next up, OK, this is the one I said, not all the games on here I still own and not all are still I still play, but I had to put it on here because this is from Twilight Creations. It is a hobby board game, but it features wind up zombies. You are playing wind up zombies. You play cards to show how many times you twist your winding thing. You put your zombie down, you aim it at other zombies and you try to knock the other zombies down. I like, come on, how can that not make this list? Like I've owned it. I, I owned it. I played it. I eventually got rid of it because it was just kind of silly. And one of the zombies always curved to the left, which kind of ruined it. They, they kind of all need to walk straight to do it. And yeah, you could kind of pivot, but that kind of ruined it for me. But talk about unique like like for a hobby board game it sounds like something you'd find at toys r us or something <laughs> and you play silly but of course it had some game mechanics like there was card play and everyone had the same decks and you had to pick are you going to wind three times or is he going to wind two oh he's winding two is he going to go far enough or is he going to stop over there silly game there we go that was all wound up uh so next up i've got doodle quest now this is a game where you flip up a board and then the players draw on an acetone sheet uh, and then put their sheets over top of that board to see how well they scored. Uh, sometimes you're trying to circle things. Other times you're trying to draw a path, navigating a maze or drawing something without touching other things. Uh, there's actually another version of this game, mm -hmm. a Looney Quest, I think it's called. Yep. Um, that's uh, the same same idea with a different theme. And they've, they, they just want a different direction with the concept. But again, you're drawing on these acetone sheets uh, without knowing exactly where all the bits and pieces you need to dodge are going to be when you flip the board over and put your sheet back down on top of it. Yeah, this one's a neat one. My kids love this game. We would still have a copy, but they got it when they were very young and it didn't survive. <laughs> one of the cool things it is it actually had templates. So like one of the things would be draw three fish, but there's like fishing lines everywhere on the board and you have to draw them so they don't get caught. And it actually came with like a template for drawing fish. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Everyone gets their templates. I did enjoy that one. I did not check out the follow-up. Now, I will call out another game that uses acetone sheets, and that is Wildlands, but in a very different way. Yep. That was another one with my kids where you're instead you're trying to build a path and the acetone sheets in the middle. And then you put the sheet over your board. So it's kind of like reverse doodle quest without drawing. 
Next, I have a true classic, which I don't know if people can see it in the background, but if they can, it's probably making them jealous. And that is Dark Tower, the original app game, as far as I'm concerned. There weren't <laughs> smartphones back there, but you had a giant electric tower with a light bulb in the bottom of it and took the D size D cell batteries in the bottom of it that spun around and played horrible tinny. I, I don't even know what you call that kind of sound effects, electronic sound effects. As you tried to move around the board and build up your hero so that you could challenge the dark tower. Um, other neat things people forget is like the tower turned so it faced towards whoever turn it was. Um, it had miniatures, which were pretty rare nowadays. And it had one of the best board designs I've ever seen where the board was modular. You couldn't change it up. It was like multi-part board, but it had plastic buildings you would snap in. And while some of those buildings went over the gap between regions, so the buildings actually held the board together. It had a peg board for tracking your health that used like the battleship pegs. There was just so much amazing stuff and innovation in that game. And that was Dark Tower, recently re-released by Restoration Games. So from what I hear, a very different game, though similar, at least in feel. And next, we have a game, or maybe not, depending on your particular opinion. We have The Mind. Now, this is a simple game where you're just putting down, uh, car putting down cards in descending order. But you can't talk. And you can, not only you can't talk, you can't, talk, you can't, can't indicate, you can't have any form of communication yes. whatsoever. Uh, and, and that leads to uh, all sorts of uh, fun and interesting things. But again, uh, everyone will have an opinion on whether or not this is a game or an activity. Uh, it is, no matter what, though, certainly unique. Yes. So the, that this one took the gaming industry by storm. Uh, first by selling out and then by people complaining about how it's not a game. I don't know if they're just jealous they couldn't get a copy because it sold out. I've got it. I enjoy it with the right group. But the whole thing with this is, is the actual rule is zero communication. And that's like impossible. The only way to play with zero communication is to play on board game arena. Like, yeah. which then how do you actually win? There has to be some, right? And every group has their own health rules for it. I don't know. If nothing else, it wins an award for being the, one of the most debated games of all time. Yep. Next, I have Time Stories. This is a really unique one um, where I, it's this one's hard to describe. You start off by taking a deck of cards and building a panorama. Then you read a bunch of cards. You then dive through the machine where you flip up new cards, which changes the panorama. And that's literally what your characters can see. So there's a unique thing there, using a deck of cards to build a panorama where you're looking for clues and stuff. Then you're inhabiting a person from that time period, Quantum Leap style. And then you're trying to solve some kind of mystery or murder or something. Um, also, super dark and twisted. The first game that you get in the box, you are inhabiting people in an insane asylum. And criminals, criminally insane. And like you're playing murderers and stuff. And then you're going through the game trying to figure things out and there's dice based combat and you're trying to solve it, but then you screw up. Well, that's okay. Cause it's called time stories. Reset the pattern. You're back in the lab. You can see your pods. The, the big bat bat big boss is mad at you and yelling at you. Dude's a total jerk. And then you go try again and you go back and you flip the cards and you try to figure out what you did wrong. And it has some of that, um, what would you call it? The the the, the um the video game everyone plays, Dark Souls, where you're like you walk or or I've been playing Odd World, where like there's certain things you're not gonna be able to stop. You just like happen to go in the spot and this person commits suicide, and you're like, wow, okay, don't go in that room, <laughs> and that's your whole trick is don't go into that room because the orderlies go and save the person, for example. And I'm kind of making that up because I don't want to spoil anything. And then once you finished it, you exit it out and you can then go buy another pack. And the next one was set in the 80s. It's called like Estrella Drive. And then another one, you're actually in a fantasy world, which I had no clue they were going to that angle. So not only are you going back in time, you're also going to fantasy worlds. Fantastically unique game. We really enjoyed the first part. But then we started hearing rumors about just how bad the ending is. And that kind of turned me off on playing the rest of the story. Mm, unfortunate. So next up, I've got Nyctophobia. We've talked about this in the past, but this is a one versus many game 
uh, depending on which version you've got, you're either playing vampire, uh, being hunted by a vampire or being hunted by a mage or axe murderer. Mm. The trick to this game, what makes this game truly unique, is that the players who are hunted, the many in the one versus many, cannot see. It's oh. a cooperative, blind game where the hunter can see the board, but the hunted need to feel around and 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 feel the board in order to try and determine where to move and how to escape from the hunter. Yeah. Uh, and there aren't too many games where losing sight is the key mecha- mechanism of the game. Yeah. I don't know if there's any others. Now, the part I love the most about this is it was created by someone to play with a blind relative. I don't remember the details at this point, but they wanted to make a game specifically to enable, daughter. yeah, enable the blind to to have an advantage even over sighted players. And I'm like, that's fascinating on its own. Yeah, absolutely. Next up, um, this isn't as unique now, but I'm, I'm going to give it credit as the game that did it first, kind of the same way we did um, uh, the Hanabi. card game Hanabi. Yeah, like Hanabi. And that is Rattlebones. This is a game from Rio Grande Games. No one's heard of. No one's played, it seems like. But you wouldn't have Dice Forge, or you wouldn't have one of the expansions for Roll for the Galaxy, and you wouldn't have, what's the massive one that just came out? Dice Realms with like 3,000 pieces on it. None of those games would exist without Rattlebones, because at the time, Rio Grande patented and trademarked plastic dice where you can swap off the sides. This game is amazing, and I, I, I want it. It's on my wish list. I need to find a copy of this, but it's long out of print, and you can't get it. But you are performers in a circus and you're going around a board like a rondelle and every spot you stop on, you can modify your dice and you start off with one die and then eventually you can get up to three dice and you're lapping around and you're getting points for stopping at different spots and enabling the monkeys and whatever. It's just kind of a silly, fun game, but with that really cool mechanic of every time you stop at a spot, you can change one of the sides on one of your three dice. Really well done. And then you get into Dice Forge, where it's more of a Euro game and a kind of deck builder card game where you can swap out your dice. And then, again, the Realms one looks amazing to me, but it's MSRP of like $180. I haven't picked up Rattlebones. I can go get Rattlebones for that much. I'm like, no, that's that's okay. I don't need to spend that much on a game. Rio Grande, if you're listening, though, I'll totally review it. <laughs> <laughs> well, next up, we've got uh, another sort of class of games. There aren't too many. Uh, but the first of them was really Captain Sonar. And this is the real-time individual mini games uh, sort of a game where everyone is playing their own little game towards a common goal. Uh, in the case of Captain Sonar, obviously, it's, it's commanding a submarine. There are a couple of different space adventure ones, mm-hmm. uh, you know, playing deck, deck, deck members like you would on, this, on the in Star Trek. And games like that, but it's that it's that real time mini games all trying to work towards a common goal. Yep. That's the interesting and unique mechanic in Captain Sonar and similar games. Whereas Captain Sonar is LARP Battleship. That is is pretty much what that is. <laughs> you are playing Hunt for Red October. You have you you literally are guessing numbers on grids and mapping things out and where people move. It's if you want a, a gamer's version of Battleship, Captain Sonar is the way to go. Um, Space Cadets is the the one Star Trek game that's out there with its own mini games. And then I think there's now The Captain is Dead is another more modern one. Um, we even reviewed one forever ago. Disaster Looms when you're on a spaceship. There are quite a few of these out there. I want to end up adding to the list last minute, um, which I can't believe it took me a bit to think of because we were kind of joking about it on the weekend, is Rail Pass. This is a pickup and deliver train game where you physically pick up and hand a train loaded with cargo cubes to the other players. It's a cooperative game where the cubes are all mixed up at the beginning of the game and you are trying to deliver them to the appropriately colored city um, in a set time limit really good game like i I was shocked by how fun it was i just this is one that i did do get a review copy of and you can check out our review for more details but i actually like wrote two mercury games and was like i need to try this because come on it's a pick up and deliver game where you actually pick up and deliver something 
Yeah, I just the, love the entire concept. The physical translation of the the conceptual mechanism is just so so brilliant yes. here. It was it's amazing that it took as long as it did for someone to actually give you a pick up and deliver game that you pick up and deliver in. Yes, and, and unlike like you know trader mechanic the trader mechanic game, there's like a physical thing happening here. It's not just like a play yeah. on words using the theme. Yeah, it's not point salad the point salad game. It's it's yes, it's a real exactly. physical action. Well, next, we have three honorable mentions. Games that made the list, but then we realized it's not actually the game that's all that unique, but rather the theme. Yeah, so Roger did call out a bunch of games where it was a theme that was unique, but there are a ton of them. I wanted to call out these ones in particular just because they're, they're, they're ones that I enjoy or I think are really neat. And the first one is Dead Man's Cabal. This is a game where you are playing lonely necromancers who are invited to a dance party don't have any friends so you raise the dead so you can show up with your um i what's the word your 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 group your there's a tv show called it the the you're a famous person and they follow you around paparazzi oh, no that's not it whatever your group cabal well cabal. yeah <laughs> cabal that's not the word i was looking for though that's all right posse there's one that's still not i don't think that was quite the word i was looking for entourage there we go entourage there thank you darkling blade wow you, you can tell <laughs> when our notes aren't that scripted because i'm like what is the name of the people who follow you to and specifically this entourage tends to be very famous people and actors though they don't call that out in the game but if you look at that card art it's pretty obvious <laughs> um added to the theme there are some neat mechanics here i almost had it on the top list because there's this whole thing where you're pulling different colored skulls out of a bag and then putting them on this track where you bump everything down and then it's the ones in the middle that get activated and then there's a whole thing where you have a pentacle where you're putting down skulls in the right pattern and you use them up to summon the dead and just and and the, here here is something why it should have been on the top it is a game board that is completely modular where you build a dungeon and it includes corridors to put between the various game pieces to make it look more like a dungeon. No other game does that, because that is totally superfluous and absolutely useless. Yep, no, absolutely. Uh, next up, we've got Holding On, The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. Now, this is a really interesting game where two to four players cooperatively are working with someone at the end of their life. Uh, Billy Kerr has had a heart attack on a uh, airline flight and is now in the hospital on his, his last days. And you're trying to learn about the life of Billy Kerr uh, and slowly care for and also learn from the patient uh, as you play through the game. Yeah, totally unique theme. Seems heavy. I don't know. I, 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 I would never buy this, but I would totally if someone had a copy, I would give it a shot. On the right night, not my birthday when I'm pounding beers. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a mood where you do and don't want to play this. Yeah, I, I am so curious about this one. Yeah. Uh, the other one I wanted to call out was Millennium Blades for a couple reasons. One, I almost put it on the list. Two, it's on like everyone else's check out what weird game, what are unique game mechanics. And the whole thing about Millennium Blades is it's a card game, a deck building card game, but it's about collectible card games but you don't actually collect cards and it's not even about playing an individual collectible card game, but rather being in a collectible card game tournament and the meta that goes with it. And I'm like, man, that is fascinating. And they did some really amusing stuff to kind of make fun of the collectible card game industry. Like your money in this game are wads of cash and you will be throwing wads of cash into the bank to pick up card packs but the card packs, when you actually go to play, are only one card because that's the only good card that came out of that pack, which is another statement on collectible card games. And then you're going to build a deck out of your cards. But then when they come up, it's more of a deck builder and they happen in a set order. And then you actually play out a tournament where each card just represents your big play, that particular game of the tournament. And again, it's affected by the meta. So if the meta right now is green, if you play cards that are green, you're going to get more points for the tournament. It's just a, a Sean needs to play this. But the problem is it's actually a fairly heavy, really detailed strategic game. Like it's up there in weight and now you kind of want it to be fast, furious, fun, and it's not. And it's just a game where unfortunately I don't play it often enough and I would have to totally relearn from the beginning how to play it again. Fair. So I think we're going to stop here because 
unique themes is just way too easy. There are so many games with unique themes. I've got a game here about two battling two. I'm just going to go through the games beside me here just for a second. So I've got a game here about battling two AIs battling each other for world domination. I've got a game about goblins trying to hoard gold. I've got a game based on an ancient Chinese sorcerer trying to destroy the world. Uh, I've got a game about colonization. Okay, there's lots of those. I've got a game about superpower heroes fighting over a city. I got a game about Vikings killing monsters. I got a game about forging steel blades. I've got Villa Paletti, which is a dexterity game where you're pulling towers out with plastic tools. I don't know. Um, I got a game about the stock market. I got a game about homeland security. A game about uh, warring clans. Uh, I don't know what happens in Stratos. You played Stratos with me. I have no idea. Yeah. It's, no. it's what happens when someone tries to combine Catan with D&D. Um, I have Stronghold, which is a game about a siege. Like, there's just so many. And then there's like, well, there's Poo, where you're monkeys who throw poo on each other. Then there's Don't Step on It, which is a dexterity game where you try to avoid stepping on poo. And then Shoot the Poop, where you flush a toilet a number of times, rolled on a die, and then poop shoots up and you catch it. And then there's coconuts where monkeys toss little brown balls over their heads trying to get, okay, wait. Okay, feces isn't that unique a theme. There's lots, lots of, I'm not going to say it, games out there. And uh, we'll, we'll add that in with uh, games about pimple popping, nose picking, yes. and uh, other bodily functions of which there are far more games than yes. there need to be out there right I, now. I totally agree. I got to say, out of the feces games, poo is actually quite fun. It's it's a solid card game that uses a D20 to attack and you can like defend and stuff. Just poo, P O O. The rest of them I, I was more choking around. So seriously, there there really are some great unique themes out there. Um, there's a game about uh, you're running a clinic, right? A, a, a medical clinic, but one of the things you have to take into account is the parking space for the doctors. And then similar to Troubled Live of Billy Kerr, another very unique one is you play the voices in Rodney Smith's head while he's on trial. So we could probably do an entire episode on our favorite games with unique themes, but I decided this week we'd stick more to mechanics. Now, if that is something you want to hear, let us know and we can toss it in our topic pile. So there are some pretty unique games and a few themes as well, but there was a second part to Roger's question. Mm. Do you know of any that have gone too far and are too weird to be fun? Okay, I know it has fans. There are people out there, but as soon as I read that part of the question, I thought of Flux. So the big thing in Flux, and it was one of the first games to do this, is the rules change during play. Not only that, the first time you play, you don't even know how to win. You literally throw out two cards, everyone gets a card, and you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Yes, I have had a good time playing Flux, but I played games where it ended before I even got to take a turn, and I played a game that went over two hours and we gave up because no one's won yet. I am not a fan of Fluck, personally. I think that whole, you don't know what the rules are. You don't even know how to win. We're going to keep changing it is is a gimmick and not a good mechanic. Yeah, another game in, in, in a similar but even less polished form was We Didn't Playtest This, uh, mm -hmm. which came out a little while ago. And uh, that's sort of what Flux feels like to a lot of people. Yes. And then was that one Mao or something like that, where no one knows the rules and everyone that enters adds a new rule? That's like a cult following thing. I know people that adore that game. Now, another one, uh, Mo at tabletopbellhop.com for your hate mail would be Gloom. Yeah, unique theme. You're, you're playing the Adams family, right? You're playing goth families and you're trying to make them as depressed as possible. Has a really cool, unique mechanic. It has these nice, thick acetone cards that you can see through. And the way they stack different parts from the card below are going to show through on the top. But I have never had a fun game of Gloom. Note, the times I played it were during tournaments. Gloom is not a good tournament game. Because mechanically, it's just not that interesting. Every time I say this, someone will come out. And I'm sure someone's already typing away at their keyboard right now. Saying, but the point of Gloom is to tell a story. There's nowhere in the rules that tells me to tell a story. It is a mechanical card game. Yes, I can tell a story in any game I play and probably have more fun. I don't think being able to tell a cool story redeems gloom in any way. All right. Well, another uh, interesting, possibly, mechanic uh, <laughs> is smell-based games. Yeah. Now, there are actually a couple more of these than I thought, but thankfully, not too many. Uh, but there are games like What's That Smell, Aroma, which we did a review mm -hmm. of here on this show, Pop Scent, and the perfumer. 
Now, unfortunately, these games, unlike many, can actually cause problems for some mm -hmm. players, uh, with Aroma in particular actually coming with warnings because it was using uh, very oils. powerful essential oil scents. Uh, and you needed to be very careful or you could cause problems for people. Uh, yeah, so, Roma, you had to watch to not get the stuff on your hands. Yeah. Like, uh, and I believe what's that smell, I believe, was the one that was actually gross smells that we were trying oh. to figure out things. It's yeah. Let's let's smell is a game is, is a is a type of, or portion of the senses that we don't necessarily need to involve in our games. Though, if you combined it with the poot, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> No, that, honestly, the aroma was the instant headache in a box game. Just opening the shrink wrap on that, Deanna was having a problem. I couldn't keep it in the same room as her. I, this, I, I, no, like, oh, look, we're going to throw a smell in our game. You know what? It didn't work for Leather Goddess as a Phobos. It doesn't work now. Yep. All right. Next one for me is actually an expansion, not a game. And it's where, in my opinion, Carcassonne jumped the shark. Um, by firing a meeple over it with a catapult. Carcassonne the catapult. What? Why? You you have a... Yes, Carcassonne's light-ish, but it's not when you play with people who know how to play. It's actually a nice, meaty, stupid, strategic game with some interesting tactics. And yes, if you remove the farm system, you ruin the game as far as I'm concerned. And if you're not playing cutthroat to try to steal places, you're not playing properly. That's how I play Carcassonne. Throwing in a thing where I put a meeple on a catapult and launch it and where it lands is no, no, not no. Why? Why are you throwing that into a strategic game? That, that's yeah. Deanna, there, put it this way. Deanna doesn't know it exists. We owned it and I played with it and I thought it was so dumb. I got rid of it because it just did not belong in that game. Yeah, this was this was probably someone who was a fan of crossbows and catapults and loved Carcassonne and didn't realize that. The two don't need to go together at all. Yeah. Like, I'll admit, Princess and the Dragon was already stretching it for me because it added this random element of a dragon that would go around and eat your meeple. I didn't like that as a strategic player. But no, once, once, oof, catapult for yeah. meeples. <laughs> like, fine, put it in a different game. I'll totally play a game about launching meeples with a catapult. I like dexterity games. Don't put it in my Carcassonne. Fair. Next, I have, going back to unique themes, I have no idea what the mechanics are in this particular game, and that is Consentical. This is a two-player card game where one player is playing a human, the other player is playing an alien, and you play through their first sexual encounter. Now, I am not opposed to games with adult themes in any way. Totally for it. Dan and I play date night games. We're into certain types of date night games. But this one is just too far out there for me. Yeah, and see, I actually, I, I, I haven't played this one yet, but I'm actually, I would actually like to, uh, because it is a game about consent, uh, and it's yeah. a card-based game where you're looking, you're doing combos and th and and things with cards in order to to try and get the things things to play out correctly, uh, and with consent, of course, consentical. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually really interest interested in this one because uh, I think enough. it's a nice way to abstract the concept. So it's not as uncomfortable as, you know, a guy and a girl sitting down on a, 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 across from each other and, and playing through an actual date. Uh, that way, you, you, you've, you've added that layer of uh, separation between reality and the people playing that helps make it a little easier to, uh, to stomach, perhaps, than it might otherwise. Totally fair. And I know non-couples who play this game, so it's not even like it's that kind of game. So totally fair, just not for me. That, like I said, that's just a little too far. Um, now another one I want to mention, we, for some reason keeps coming up on our show, like the last four episodes, I think we mentioned this game and that is tales of the Arabian nights. I don't know. Maybe it's just on my mind lately. We're going to have to, it's, it's like, you know, you're craving pizza hut. You need to get pizza hut and it won't go away until you have pizza hut and pizza hut. No, is not the same as craving pizza. And that's not the same as craving Windsor pizza. But anyway, I think I need to play tales of the Arabian nights to get it out of my system. But anyway, this stuck out because it's a game that doesn't work. So it's a unique game in the fact that they made a sandbox story driven experience with a massive book and ridiculous like seeds where you like run into a beggar and choose from eight options. And then that's randomized on a table to get the beggar's response. Like you'll never play the same game again. It plays completely different every time. You get a very Sinbad, Shaharazad, 
style story out of it. It's very epic. All of that's going on. You even have a feeling of exploration and going to different parts of the world and your character develops. Um, you can have all kinds of wonky magic things to happen to you. And it's a great experience. But kind of like some people say about the mind, it's almost not a game. That part of it's great, but they forgot to make it a game. So what they did is they threw in this weird arbitrary system where you're trying to get the 40 points of two different stats and you set your goal of how much of the 40 points are in either stat. But there's very little when you're playing to control which of those two you get. So you're just going to spend the game going, nope, I'm out of balance. Oh, I'm out of balance. Oh, I'm out of balance. And most people that play this game, just like Telestrations, throw that out, play until they're sick of playing. Until like, you know what? We're going to play Tales of the Arabian Nights for four hours tonight because it's good enough. I will happily play Tales of the Arabian Nights for four hours. Even better, you hide your totals. Like there's a way to hide them so the other players don't know what you're looking towards. But I don't know of any way to actually manipulate another players that it matters. It's like, like they came with this amazing system for exploring the world. So now there are two different, well, sorry, not different, two versions of Tales from the Arabian Nights. The original from back um, in the 80s, I want to say, possibly that, that old. Uh, so the original was 1985. Mm -hmm. It was then re-implemented by Zedman Games That's the one, yeah. in 2009. But interestingly, it's being re-implemented again this year oh, wow. as Tales of the Arthurian Knights. See, that was it. Like, why didn't they do more? <laughs> so, now, there is supposedly another game that's the sci-fi version of this. It's Agents of Smurf. But I don't know anything about that one. I don't know if it's sci-fi or modern. But there's a game called Agents of Smurf that supposedly does this right. But I like the Sinbad theme. I grew up watching the kind of terrible stop-motion Sinbad movies. And Eye of the Tiger. Is it Eye of the Tiger? Eye of the Tiger is the Rocky thing. Eye of the Something was my favorite growing up. I don't even remember the name now. <laughs> where, it, where it had a guy in a monkey suit was the prince, and they had to put him into the beam of light. Like, I don't know. I grew up on that. I love it. Well, we can keep an eye out for Tales of the Arthurian Knights coming I'm out curious, this year. I, hopefully they do something to so you can win and end the game. <laughs> Another one I tossed down is Dragon and Flagon. So this one just fails in, in as a game again. So concept awesome. You are doing a trap and brawl. Yes, I've done a million of them over the years, but they're always in a role playing game. I've never played a board game where you play a, a tavern brawl. This involves kicking over chairs, shoving tables, pulling the rug out from people, picking up mugs and throwing them. Fantasy races that each have their own asymmetric abilities. But it's a programmed movement game that plays slower than D and D four E combat, and I think that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> well, I think while we're talking briefly talking about uh, in combat, I'm going to mention one that we took off the list, but uh, but theme wise, it's interesting, and that's Bloody Inn. Now, this okay. is a game where you're actually running uh, inns. Everyone is running their own inn, but you have discovered that it's more if uh, efficient to. Uh, basically kidnap and kill your patrons and steal all their money. Uh, and the winner is the person who finishes with the most money uh, without being investigated by the police. And there's all sorts of interesting mechanics about if the, the night is, is over and you haven't buried all your bodies, you have to pay a grave digger to go and hide <laughs> the body. He's for you. And um, so the bloody Inn is a 2015 right. intriguing sort of. <laughs> it's a different one. That yeah. is definitely. Uh, similar to it, I'm going to bring up Bring Out Your Dead. You play a grave digger, and you're getting the coffins to bury, but you're like a medieval one, and it's actually an area majority game, and you have different colored coffins for the different players, and you're trying to own the best plots. But, like, talk about a unique game. It's actually a really good gateway area control game if you're okay with that theme. Yeah. And then recently we played um, Gloomy Graves, where you're a monster grave digger in, in the yeah. middle of a big war in, like, a world like D&D. And you're the, the 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 sad people responsible for burying all the dragon and skeleton, clearing the Warhammer battlefield after it and burying the dead. Yep. So again, unique theme. Now what I'm going to toss in here is, that one making me think of it, is games with overlapping cards. The first one I played was Hokkaido, where you have a card with like eight different symbols on it. You have another card with eight different symbols and you have to overlap at least part of them. And you can tuck under and above. So that's another one. I hear Circle the Wagons is a better modern version of that, but that's also a unique one. But that worked, so I'm kind of jumping backwards. Yep. Yes. 
Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it out because I I think I, you want to talk about a unique game at least when it came out, Cards Against Humanity. Let's get sit down and get a huge marketing team to promote a game that's all about being as offensive as possible and get people to laugh at terrible jokes that shouldn't be made, but feel like it's okay because they're playing a game and the card, it's the game's fault for making me say this horrendous thing. Now, what's now, interesting, you know, we have talked about, I mean, we've talked about this any number of times and we always will recommend Apple versus Apple for the, uh, for, for its for, alternate. For, 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 yes. Yeah. If you want to play this kind of game, go for it. Interestingly, I ran across uh, one article specifically saying don't waste your time with Apple versus Apple. You're not getting the, the full experience if you're not playing the actual Cards Against Humanity. Now, I will say they have gotten a lot better over the years. They've removed a number of cards. They've done some things to make Cards Against Humanity better. And they are also known for the coming up with the concept of here's a hand can of funny things. There's a funny thing on the table. Match them and then vote on who made it the funniest. There are so many spinoffs of that, so I have to give them credit for that. But just the the, the entire point, the, the name of the game, Cards Against Humanity, it's just, I'll admit, I played it. The first time I played it, I was laughing, I was having fun, so was everyone else. And it wasn't really till after the fact, I was kind of thinking about what we were laughing about, and I'm like, boy, was that really funny? Um, and part of it was one of the players we were playing with left the game night. And that's where it kind of sunk in. You're like, wow, yeah, we're just showing our privilege here. Like, like, yeah, none of this affects me, so it's funny. But when I actually spend half a second thinking about it, I'm like, well, why are we doing this? Let, let's let's go play something better. Fair enough. Uh, another uh, really bizarre theme I ran across for the first time today, and that <laughs> is Donner Dinner Party. And this is, yes, the Donner Family Cannibalism Game for uh, your standard kind of player elimination deduction game, but with one of the top tasteless themes out there. Yeah, that's up there. Oh, uh, uh, that was, yeah. Now, now, I, similar game with not quite as offensive, but still I think it's taken it too far, is Lifeboats, where you're mm -hmm. all on Lifeboats and you have to vote someone off, which yeah. could be basically the same game with a slightly better theme, but like slightly? Yeah. That was one I did not enjoy playing. That that was one that people were bitter by the end. Like the the least person popular person in the group's going to get thrown off the back of the boat, and that's not really cool. Yep. Um, next, I have one that we reviewed. Um, might get me a little bit of hate, hate mail here, and that's Tower of Madness. Um, you have uh, Smirk and Dagger Games decided to take Kerplunk and make a gamers game out of it. And they did it using a giant Cthulhu tower with tentacles sticking out of it, which seems really cool. And different colored marbles, and some marbles were madness, and some were anger, and all these marbles. But then they threw it with this surprisingly good Yahtzee game, where you're trying to make sets of different symbols on the dice to advance your character and level up and get points. And the whole problem with this, like it sounds great in theory, and I, I was really ex uh, excited to try this game. I wanted this game. And then I played it, and when, what it was is it clicked in that the fun part of the game, which is pulling the tentacles out and watching the marbles fall, only happens when you play badly. And you're, like, incentivized to not roll the dice and get points because you just want the tower to go. And it's just <laughs> a really odd, like, to me, it's a mishmash. Like, it just didn't fit well together. I just think there could have been something done uh, it's not an old game, but I kind of want like the Restoration Games version of Tower of Madness, where <laughs> where they did something to make the gameplay better. I don't know how to fix that one. Yeah. Now, I'm going to throw one more on here, unless we come up with something else before we get to the end of the segment. But we've been talking about this for a long time, and that is Tragedy Looper. Um, this is time stories done different with an anime theme. It's a time travel game, one versus many, where that one player is almost a GM. It's It's much more of a GM role. Um, you're moderating as opposed to trying to beat the players, but then there are ways you play to try to stop them too. You, you, you start off, you're like, you know, typical 17 year old anime teenagers out of high school wandering around and something terrible happens and then time resets. Now you start playing again and you can do things like you can go be nice to someone and you put heart counters on them or you can warn, warn someone and then you put worry counters on them or you can tell someone to move or not to move and you can move around the board and see different things happen and you just keep kind of doing that and honestly like the second run probably pretty randomly 
And then the tragedy happens again and time resets. And you keep doing that, trying to deduce exactly what you need to do to prevent the tragedy. And you just get shots over and over trying to figure it out. Now, the problem is the game is too complicated. There are too many moving parts, too many little things to track. It's almost impossible to learn. It gives you this tutorial to play through that takes like three hours. And you basically have to do that before playing an actual scenario. So unless you're playing with the same group that's going to get together, you know, two days later to play again, and then two days later after that to play again, I'm sure there are groups out there that managed to internalize Tragedy Looper, but I've played it four times now, and I still, there's no way I could teach it tomorrow. There's no way I could play it on either role. Yeah, like this it's is, got a great it's a idea. Three, five, five. It's a three yeah, and a half week game. Yeah, 3.5. It's almost as much as Weather Machine, and it's an anime game about time travel. It just there's too much going on. It, it it's such a great idea and it's so close. I need Tragedy Looper Light, and then maybe I'd like it. And it definitely does have it fa its fans because even 2023, there's a new expansion coming out for Tragedy wow. Looper. There you go. They like, said so people, I still have it because Deanna's like, you can't get rid of it until I get to try it. And I'm like, oh, I have to teach that game. It's been again. going for 12 years now, and it's still got expansions coming out. Yeah. So but I, I personally think they overdid it. They overthought it. It's overworked. I don't know. Didn't work for me. Well, now I got, I got to say there are others. I, I all day I've been racking my brain thinking, I know I've been at public play events when someone's shown up with a game and I'm like, what the heck is this? But I just, I haven't been able to put my finger on tonight. So I'm wondering if maybe next week I'll be like, excuse me, I get the hiccups. So I need water. Um, I'm going to show up next week with like, no, here's the list of really <laughs> over the top games that didn't work. Right. But for this week, that's it for our discussion of out of the box board games, games doing something unique. Now, what's a game you thought took things out of the box? Let us know about it in the comments below. Yeah, we are sure there are way more oddball games out there, games doing something totally different. Now, before we check into the lobby, just a reminder that we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions, just like we answered a question from Roger tonight. You can send us questions by clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, firing off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hitting us up on social media. 